Hi, I'm Pastor Brad Johnson from California Community Church, and I'm so glad that you made the decision to be a part of this community, and we're honored to be a part of your life, wherever you're watching from. And we have a ton right here in California, but we have so many of you watching from other places around our country and some other parts of the world, and we want you to know it matters that you are a part of California community. We are at the halfway point in this series that I'm teaching on relationships. How do you move from relationships that hurt you to relationships that are actually healing and lead you to happiness and to health? As your pastor in this church for over 10 years now, I can tell you the number one issue I've had to help people navigate is the issue of conflict resolution. I mean, conflict is everywhere. You have conflict at work and conflict in your family and conflict with neighbors. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Conflict. Here's the number one cause of conflict. You might want to write this down. Relationships. <laughs> if you don't have relationships, you don't have conflict. Well, we're not going to do that. We're all in relationships. Relationships matter. That's just a fact of life. And as true as relationships are a fact of life, conflict is going to be a part of those relationships. Now, I want to say right up front, having conflict in a relationship isn't bad. Handling conflict in the wrong way, that's what does the damage. And so we really need to learn some biblical steps to resolve conflict, to get us to the place where our relationships are fulfilling and joy-producing and we get past those difficult times that we're all going to have. That's just a part of life. That's just because imperfect people make up all relationships. But there is a way to navigate through that. What I want to do is start with a verse from the Bible. Now, this was written by a very preeminent follower of Jesus, a scholar who began to follow Jesus, and he learned from Jesus, and then he wrote some things down so that we can learn from Jesus. And look what he wrote. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. And then we get into it. As much as possible, as far as it depends on you, Live in peace with everyone. Now notice, it doesn't say, hey, just live in peace with everybody. No, Scripture doesn't cop out and the Scripture is not dishonest. It is so truthful. And I want you to see a couple caveats in that verse. It says first, as much as possible, be at peace with all people. Now, why would it say it like that? Because it's not always possible. I love the honesty of the Scripture. There are some people... No matter how much you try to appease, no matter how much time you try to support, no matter how much time you try to please or meet their needs or go the extra mile or whatever, there are some people, they are so hurting in their emotional space, so empty in their emotional bucket, you're never going to fill them, you're never going to fix them, they're just going to be that way, and you're not going to be able to be in peace with them. Now, God even acknowledges that. Doesn't mean we don't try. But as much as possible, sometimes it's not possible. And it says, as much as it's possible, as much as it depends on you. You know what that means? You do have to clean up your side of the street. But that's what you're responsible for. You can't control the emotions of someone else. You can't control the reactions of someone else. Just like they can't control you. So as much as it depends on you, as much as you can, your side of the issue, be at peace with everyone. Now, why would God tell us as much as possible, be at peace? Because when we're not, there are some really negative things that begin to happen in our life. When we live in constant conflict, let me quickly give you three things that you can count on. This is just going to happen when you're in conflict with other people. First of all, you're going to have your fellowship with God blocked. Conflict blocks my fellowship with God. We're told this over and over again in the Bible. Look at what John, the best friend of Jesus, wrote down. The person who says, I love God and hates his neighbor is what? What does it say? Is a liar. Remember the greatest commandment in the scripture? Love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love your neighbor. When you're not loving your neighbor, you're also going to have a problem with God. Here's the next thing conflict does. It hinders my prayers. You might not know this, but the Scripture teaches us many, many, many times that if we want to have an effective prayer life, the relationships in our life need to be healthy and whole. Let me give you one more. 
conflict hinders my happiness. So if conflict really hurts my fellowship with God, hinders my prayer, and hinders my happiness, wouldn't all of us want to figure out how we can resolve conflict? Listen, conflict is possible to handle well, but we have to determine that we want to. I've known some people in my life, you probably have too, it seems like they kind of get off on the turmoil. They're always in chaos, and they kind of feed off the energy that's so negative. But unless you're like that, you know, some sociopath, psychopath, they just love the drama, they love the conflict, they love the pain. Okay, voluntary suffering, let them have it. If you want health and healing and wholeness in your relationships, you're going to want to pay attention as we walk through these steps to biblical conflict resolution. Here we go. Number one, first, you initiate. You initiate. That's the starting point. You don't wait for somebody else to come to you. The scripture says you be a peacemaker. Now listen, it doesn't say be a peace lover. It says be a peacemaker. That's an active verb. You have to make peace. God is not the one that's going to say, just shove it under the rug Just ignore it. Just deny it. No. How many times have you been in a relationship where so much stuff gets piled under that rug, the rug looks like a mountain in your living room? Stuff has to be dealt with. Listen, marriage is a good example of this. I I, I don't know what you're pretending is not a problem in your marriage right now, but I bet some of you listening are having an issue that you haven't talked about yet. It could be sex, it could be money, it could be family, it could be children, it could be communication, it could be your values, it could be your work schedule, it could be honesty or dishonesty. You know what the Bible says? Step one, initiate. Conflict is never going to be resolved accidentally. Have you ever heard this expression, time heals everything? I just want you to know that's not true. Time can heal some things, but time doesn't heal everything. If time healed everything, You would just have to go to your doctor's office and sit in the waiting room, and eventually you would just be well. You'd never really need the doctor because time will have healed you. See, the truth of it is, and we know this, time actually makes some things worse. You have an open wound that's infected, and then it turns into gangrene. Then you have a part of your body amputated. Same thing happens with an open wound in a relationship. That conflict turns to resentment, and that resentment turns to bitterness. How many people have you known? 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. Bitter people because of unresolved conflict in their life. And look at all the years of happiness and health and healing that they could have enjoyed if they had just said, I'm going to take the initiative to deal with it. So the only way to resolve conflict is to face it. The only way to resolve conflict is to face it. But we don't do that. Now, why, why do you think it is we don't do that? I think there's several reasons. Let me just give you a couple of these. I think first, we're afraid of conflict. So you'd have to deal with your fear of conflict. I, I have people all the time say to me, but I just don't like conflict. I don't want the drama. And I'd say to you, well, welcome to the human race. Again, only really sick people like the drama. Healthy people don't want it. But that doesn't mean that we're not supposed to deal with it. Matter of fact, see, you're living in drama by not dealing with the drama. What if you could get rid of all the conflict by initiating and getting over your fear? I've seen tough guys, like tough guys, really struggle with this. Like they, you know, they may face down some really incredible odds and do some things that would scare most of the world. But I'll tell you, the thing that makes them melt like butter is when their wife says, you know, we need to talk. <laughs> and those really tough guys now go weak in the knees and they start to tremble because they're afraid of dealing with what's coming. This is as old as the first man and woman in the Bible, the story of Adam and Eve. They're in the Garden of Eden. You remember that story. And they, they blow it in their relationship with God. And because the relationship with God is broken, their relationship with each other is broken. And you remember what happened? They're hiding because of their sin. And they realize now that they have nakedness. And they don't want to face the truth about what they've done and, and, and what they look like in the eyes of God. But when God comes to them in the Garden of Eden, look what Adam said. I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. You know what he means by being naked? 
It means being exposed. He means being vulnerable. He means he was afraid of really being seen. And so he hid. And we've been hiding from God and hiding in our relationships ever since. See, it's not really the fear of conflict that we live with. It's the fear of vulnerability. It's the fear of being exposed. It's the fear of having our emotions out there. That's what people fear. This is why people don't really experience deep intimacy in relationships. I'm not talking about sex when I say intimacy. I'm talking about something deeper than that. I'm talking about something soul to soul, true intimacy. And it's letting another person see everything. See the insides of you. You're emotional in front of them. They see the emotions of you. You're honest in your thoughts with them. They see the thoughts of you. You just strip it all away. And you are who you really are in front of them. And that is soul intimacy. And if we're going to destroy conflict, if we're going to resolve conflict in our lives, we're going to need to get past this fear. It's not the fear of conflict. We're going to have to get past this fear of vulnerability. When we're vulnerable, you say, well, Brad, if I drop my guard, I might get hurt. Listen, here's the truth. You're hurting anyway because you haven't dealt with the conflict takes a little courage. Cowards never resolve conflict. Let me say it again. Cowards never resolve conflict. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask you to say it with me. Cowards never resolve conflict. Only courageous people do. And God helps us with this. Look what the scripture says. God has not given us a spirit of fear. No. He's not given us a spirit of timidity. No. What's he given us? A spirit of power and love and self-discipline. When the Spirit of God, we ask Jesus to be the Lord and leader of our life, He inhabits, He resides within us, and He goes to work giving us the attributes to live the life that He created us to live. One of those attributes is power. One of those attributes is love. Listen, when my love is greater than my fear, I will do things I was afraid to do. When my love is greater than my fear, I'll do things I was afraid to do. Love is what motivates our courage. We deal with the conflict because we become courageous enough, because we are loving enough to do it. So the first thing you have to do is deal with your fear of the conflict. The second thing you have to do is deal with timing. Like timing is everything. You know, right before you're going to bed at night or right when somebody's getting ready to rush out the door. I mean, there's all kinds of things I could say about this. But when the timing is right, it makes all the difference in the world. And if the timing is wrong, it makes all the difference in the world. All right? Always my move. That's what I want to say. That's called being a peacemaker. I make the move. I initiate, get over the fear. The timing is right. Look what Jesus said. If you're standing before the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that somebody has something against you, you leave your offering there beside the altar. You go at once and first be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your gift to God. You talk about initiating conflict resolution. God says reconciliation takes priority over worship. Let me say it again. Reconciliation takes priority over worship. I mean, we like to come to church. And I'll tell you, here in California where we have so many restrictions, we can't wait till things get back the way they used to be in the good old days where you could just come into a building and sit side by side with people and worship. We love that. We love the fellowship of the church. We love learning from God's word. We love to hear these principles about life. We love singing the songs to God. But God says, before you do that, more important than that is if you have a broken relationship, you go out and you make that right. And then come back in and enjoy your worship with God. See, Jesus reminds us we're not supposed to ignore this. And it doesn't matter if you're the one who's been offended or if you're the one that did the offending. It's always your move. You be the peacemaker. And when did he say go? At once, as soon as possible. Don't delay it. Don't postpone it. So get over your fear. Do it at the right time. Do it now. Now's the right time. 
And then plan this meeting. Plan this meeting. You take the initiative and you plan the meeting. Let me tell you about this meeting. This is your conflict resolution meeting. This is when you finally sit down with someone and you're going to talk about the issue that has been dividing you. So you've got to choose the right time. I've already said that timing is everything. And the best time is when it's a good time for both of you. Second, I want you to choose the right place. Now, this is super, super important. You can't just do this anywhere. It's got to be the right place. And it might be like, you know, when the kids are asleep or in bed or or better yet, you have a babysitter because this could get emotional. This could be where you're really being honest and you're letting your feelings be expressed and you're listening to their feelings too. So you've got to have the right place and the right time for that. And then the third thing, I'd ask you to pray before this meeting. See, when we set this before God, and we invite God into the conversation, it changes everything. And then just let me give you one more tip. Come with a positive attitude. Come with a positive attitude. Like let your goal be to work on the problem and not to attack each other. You're not coming in to demean. You're not coming in to prove you're right. You're not coming in to, you know, drill down deeper on the disagreement. You're coming in with the right attitude. You've just prayed. And you want to say, is there a way we can find some healing here? You come with a positive attitude. Now, before we go on to the other steps, this is just step one in this whole process, which is to initiate. And I've given you a bunch of tips about that. But before we go to the next part, what I want to do is I want to pray for you. I'm just going to pause right here in the middle of my teaching, and I want to pray for you. Would you bow your heads for a second? I want you to think about right now, Who you need to resolve conflict with? Who do you need to have a conflict resolution meeting with? That tough conversation where you're honest and where healing can begin. Maybe it's somebody you haven't talked to in a long time. Or maybe you talk to them all the time and maybe they have no idea that there's this conflict burning or boiling inside of you. But get a name in your mind, all right? And now I want you to pray this. Say it in your heart, God, I don't like conflict. I'm asking for your courage to deal with this and to deal with it in the right way. Now let me pray for you. Jesus, all these people who are a part of this message right now, give them the courage and the strength to deal with these issues because you want them to experience joy and happiness in all the relationships of their life. And we need your help to do that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, big point number one, you initiate. You be the peacemaker. Number two, confess. This is going to be a shorter point, but it's a hard point to get your head around. Listen, you could be 99.9% right in the conflict and less than a full percent wrong in the conflict but if you're willing to own that one percent there's a word for that in the bible and it's called humility now my guess is that in the conflicts in your life i know it's true in the conflicts in my life we are more than one percent of the problem that's why we never go into this condemning pointing fingers or attacking Because humility acknowledges I'm a part of this. See, everybody has blind spots. Blind spots are those parts of us that we can't see. They're the parts of us where we don't really know what we've contributed to the problem. That's why Jesus deals with this in the very first sermon he ever taught. He went right after this idea. And look what Jesus said. Why do you take notice of the little splinter in your friend's eye when you don't notice the big piece of wood in your own eye? First, take the log out of your own eye. Then you will clearly be able to take the splinter out of your friend's eye. You know what he's saying? Look at your part of it. Start there. And that's called humility. So think about this. Maybe you go in and you confess, hey, I've been a little unrealistic in my expectations or i've been a little insensitive to your feelings and needs or i've been a little demanding or selfish or quick-tempered i mean 
identify and then humbly acknowledge, confess your part. Humility does, though, take a lot of maturity. Listen to me. Humility takes a lot of maturity. Immature people can't do this. Immature people can't stand to admit when they're wrong. Only mature people can really be humble. You know the number one cause for divorce in our world today? Number one, it's, yeah, I said that wrong. It's not the cause. You know what the number one excuse is for divorce in our culture today? Incompatibility is what we say. Listen, incompatibility is kind of a myth. I think it was probably made up by divorce attorneys. Really, you started your relationship incompatible. I mean, nobody's the same. Everybody's different. And all incompatibility means is we've got some parts to us that don't fit with other parts of us. But here's what we also know. Any two people can get along if they grow up. And any two people can get along if they decide to put the other person's interests first and and not be selfish or self-centered in that relationship. You've never had a completely compatible day with anybody. What you've learned to do is to put your desires down and put their desires first on a lot of issues. And that's how you get along. See, the issue is not incompatibility. The issue is really immaturity. Imagine how many fewer divorces we would have if on that little form, instead of just saying, you know, irreconcilable differences or incompatibility, what if we had to write down, we're divorcing because we are both immature and we refuse to grow up? (laughs) What if you had to write down, we're divorcing because I just won't admit my part of the problem? More marriages die because of inflexibility the unwillingness to move, the unwillingness to show a little humility. Now listen, every relationship on earth is going to get to a sticking point where you just say, you know, I feel stuck. I feel like I can't get on with it, and I feel like I can't get out of it. What do you do then? And in all relationships that go to these places, and the successful ones know how to get past them. Here's how you get past them. It's like a log jam. Have you seen pictures of this or or movies where this happened? You know, all these logs in a river, and then they just all kind of go different directions. Then they collide, and then they bog down, and now you've got a log jam, and nothing's moving. You know the answer to a log jam? You know where you start to uh, unjam that? One log. One willingness to move. One person to take the first step. Humility says, I'll be that person. When you're in a relational logjam, and you might be in one right now, there's one way out, but it always helps, and it's humility. You make the first move. Humility breaks the logjam. Let me tell you a way to start this. One sentence. You just say, I'm sorry. I was just thinking of myself. Start there, and you're on your way to moving forward. That's confession. Point number one, you initiate. Point number two, you confess your part. And then here's a big one. Number three, you listen. You listen. Something we've learned in this whole series. I've taught it twice now, and I just want to refer to it again today. And it's the principle that hurt people hurt people. So what we have to learn to do is listen for the hurt, not listen to the words. What is causing them to behave the way they are? What's causing them to say what they're saying? Rather than focus on the behavior and the words, let's get to the root of the problem because that's where we're going to find the solution. What we know, if somebody's hurting you in your life, there is somebody hurting them or who has hurt them in the past in their life. And you might have been the one to cause their hurt. But what I know, hurt people very often lash out and then they're hurting other people. So what we have to learn to do in conflict is listen for the hurt. We have to listen for the hurt. Say it with me. We have to listen for the hurt. So somebody may be coming at you really, really angry, but what you end up hearing is that at some point something offended them. Maybe they felt unappreciated. 
Maybe they felt unloved. Maybe they felt, you know, cheated out of something at some point or taken advantage of in some way. But then their hurt comes out. If you want to learn to connect with people, if I want to be able to connect with people, what we need to do is get to their point of need. Like what is really going on? What do they really need here? And so we learn to hear their hurt. Let me give you a great verse. And this comes from the brother of Jesus. And look what James wrote. Be quick to listen. Okay. Slow to speak. Okay. And slow to get angry. Wow, if there's one verse for conflict resolution, it's right there. You know, God gave you two ears and one mouth because we're supposed to listen twice as much as we talk. When we're talking, we can't hear the hurt that somebody else has. That one verse could save you thousands and thousands of dollars in marriage counseling or conflict resolution counseling. You're welcome. (laughs) Let me give you another one. Philippians chapter 2, look at this. Each of you should look not only for your own interests. See, if we just get that right, because what do we do when we're in conflict? We look out for ourselves. We're defending ourselves. We want our position known. We're explaining ourselves. We're telling you why we're right. But what if you didn't look out for your own interests only, but also the interests of others? Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ. There's an important word in those verses, and it's the word look. It's the Greek word skopos. We get telescope, microscope out of that. And what he's saying is we focus, we really focus on the other person. Realize you're most like Christ when you pay attention to the other person's needs. And you do that when you listen. So you initiate, you confess, you listen. Look at number four. And then it's your time to speak. So how do you do it? You speak the truth in love. This is a verse from the Bible, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. It says this, speak the truth in love. It may be the truth that I'm saying to you, but if I don't say it from a place of love, I'm actually on the wrong side of the issue. I see this among Christians all the time. Well, it's just the truth. Or just what God says, or whatever. But the truth was never meant to be a club that we use to beat somebody over the head with. The truth was always to set people free. The truth was always to demonstrate the love that we have for them. You look at the internet. People are writing down all kinds of things that they believe in their heart are true, but they do it with such hate. And they do it with such anger. And you know what? Nobody's ever been convinced by that. Nobody's opinion's ever been changed by that. Most of us, once we feel the heat coming off of that, we realize there's not much light there. There's only heat there. And so we just shut down. That's why the Scripture says if we're going to resolve conflict with another person, it's not just a matter of telling the truth. We have to do it from a place of love. This is centuries and centuries old, this stuff I'm teaching. Look at this. This was written by Solomon a couple thousand years ago. Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. We're talking about relationships that heal. And the tongue of the wise, the way you say something, can help lead to that healing. Listen, you'll never get your point across by being cross. You're never persuasive when you're abrasive. And so, I was talking about that preeminent scholar, his name was Paul, who wrote a lot of our Christian scriptures. Because of that, he says this, don't use harmful words. Only use helpful words. The kind that build up and provide what is needed. So, You get into this conversation with a person. You want to resolve the conflict. You've initiated. You've confessed your part. You've allowed them to speak. And you've really tried to listen and get behind what they're really feeling, what they really need, because you're putting their needs above your own needs. I mean, this is just great stuff. But now it's your turn to talk. 
But before those words come out of your mouth, you have to run it through the grid of these scriptures we just read. Is what I'm going to say going to be helpful or hurtful? Is it going to build up our relationship or is it going to further tear it down? Is it persuasive or do I just want to be abrasive? I'm talking about the skill of learning to attack the problem without attacking the person. Most people go through their whole life and they never learn how to do this. Attacking the problem rather than attacking the person. And that actually sets us up for our fifth and final point for today. And here it is. Number five, fix the problem, not the blame. I've probably said that a thousand times in my counseling of other people. Learn to fix the problem. Don't fix the blame. What we want to do when we fight is be right. What we want to do is have them acknowledge that they were wrong. And so we want to fix the blame. It was your fault. And then none of that. Have we taken any steps to fix the problem? Listen, you can only blame or heal. Can't do both at the same time. Let me say it again. You can only blame or heal, but you cannot do both at the same time. You don't have enough energy for both. Remember, I've said this before. The way you spell blame is be lame. (laughs) If you want to be lame, then go ahead and blame. That's not what God tells us, not with his wisdom. Look at the wisdom of God. Rid yourself of such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Why get rid of those things, do you suppose? Because those are all the tools of blaming. Those are all the tools of going after someone. Those are all the tools of using our tongue as a weapon of mass destruction. And listen, end of the day, blaming is judging. It's determining that they were completely wrong and we were completely right. And listen, God's the judge. And we had a part in this problem. Now let me say, conflict resolution does not have as its goal that we end up agreeing on everything. In every loving relationship, some disagreements, some different points of view are always going to exist. But what we're learning to do is understand that we can walk side by side without seeing eye to eye. We do it all the time. We can be disagree, but be agreeable in our disagreements. We do it all the time. We can have unity without having uniformity. We do it all the time. And it's called wisdom. There are some things you're just never going to agree on. Some things you're just never going to change about the other person. Some things that are never going to change about you. Well, does that mean all relationships have to end when you get to a conflict? No. You focus on the parts you have in common. You focus on the love that you do have For the person you focus on the problems you can address and fix and change together. I tell couples in couple counseling, say, just imagine you have a table here and you you come in. I say, what you what you come in as is adversaries, and I'm on this side of the table and you're on that side of the table, and you anticipate going after each other. I said, how about you imagine this? Here's a better picture. Both of you come around and get on the The same side of the table, side by side. Now you're not attacking each other. Now together you're attacking the problem. That's how you reconcile. That's how you lay this conflict down. That's how you build bridges with each other rather than building walls against each other. And isn't this what Jesus did for you? There was a big conflict between you and God. You going your way and God having his way. And Jesus came and he took the hand of God with one hand and he took your hand with the other and he went to the cross and he died just like this. And he did it so that he could bring the two together and we are most like Jesus when we're bridge builders, when we're reconcilers, and when we are peacemakers too. I want to pray for you again. Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, if we could get our hearts right with you, 
learn that you are a peacemaker. You are the way maker. You are the conflict resolver. You are the bridge builder. If we get in touch with that and we begin a relationship with you and we let you live in us fully, then we're going to become more and more like you because that's what you do. You begin to form our character and shape it like a, like a potter making a beautiful work of art. You shape us. And as you do that, we begin to be like you. And that changes everything. It changes our relationships. We're, we're willing then to initiate and be humble enough to confess our part. And we're willing enough to listen. And we're loving enough to speak truth in a way that builds up and doesn't tear down. We learn how to fix the problem rather than fix the blame. Father, that's what we want. A lot of us can use this. And all of this can be put right to work today in relationships that need repair all over the place. So I pray, Father, for your help. We need your help. And we trust your help. We want to do it your way. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen.